I am here with Swami Sarva Priyananda. Swamiji, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Sam. Uh, well, I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I, I saw a, a talk you gave. You've given many talks that are available on YouTube, but you gave one on the differences and similarities between Advaita Vedanta and Buddhism. And that this is really at the, the center of my interest, resolving the puzzles or, or apparent puzzles of uh, self and no self and non-duality and emptiness and just ha- how to help people think about these things. So th- that's where I want to arrive with you. But before we get there, perhaps you can tell us how you got into meditation, how and when you became a Swami. What, what is your spiritual background? Well, I grew up in a small town in the eastern part of India on the east coast, a place called Bhubaneswar. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I was, as a kid also, I was curious about, you know, spirituality, God. We had books of Swami Vivekananda lying about the house, and I read them avidly. My parents were close to the uh, Ramakrishna Mission, which is the monastic order I eventually ended up joining. And so when I read Swami Vivekananda talking about that God is real or, or there is an ultimate spiritual reality which we can all access. And that is the point of human life that takes us beyond sorrow. All of that somehow, it called to me deeply. And I thought, this is what I want to do in life. And so when I finished my education, I joined this order of monks, which is called the Ramakrishna Order of Monks. I mean, one way of relating to it would be the first Hindu monk to come and teach in the United States was Swami Vivekananda, yeah. who was a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, who was probably the greatest mystic in Hinduism in recent times, certainly in the 19th century. So that's how I joined. Even before becoming a monk, I was interested in meditation. I was interested in Vedanta philosophy, yoga philosophy. I didn't know much about Buddhism and more than, I mean, what you normally l- learn in a history, in, in, you know, a history course at school. And then I, I had already started meditation uh, before uh, becoming a monk. And then I joined uh, the order. And I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but it's been, I became a monk in 1994. Mm-hmm. And so 10 years of novitiate training. And then you take the final vows of monasticism. So I formally, I became a Swami, which is a name for a monk, in 2004. And I was in India until 2015, when I was sent to our centers here in the West, in in America first, in the Vedanta Society of Southern California in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And then here in New York, in the Vedanta Society of New York, where... Actually, Swami Vivekananda, when he had come to this country in 1893 in the World Parliament of Religions to represent Hinduism, he came to New York in 1894 and he started, this is, I think, the first Hindu ashram in the West. So this is where I am right now. Hmm. Uh, That's interesting. Uh, So yeah, actually, I've been to, the only place on the east coast of India I've been is Bhupaneswar. So that's, I didn't realize you had come come from there. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Uh, I was in India during the um, colorful and uh, depressing uprising around the temple and and uh, the mosque. In now, I'm forgetting where that was. Ayodhya. Ayodhya, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that would be 1994. I remember 1992. I think 1992. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. So yeah, and we were. I had to get a train. We were in uh, Varanasi. And we had to get to Dharamsala for the um, the Mind and Life conference with the Dalai Lama, and everything. All the trains were were frozen during the the, the riots, and the only way to get out of Varanasi was and to get to Delhi at that point to get to Dharamsala was to get on a plane to the east coast, which landed us in Bhubaneswar, and we were, we spent I think three days there before we could get a plane back to Delhi. So it was just we just had to randomly landed there on the coast for a few days, but uh, it was beautiful. And yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, with Ramakrishna. Obviously, I've, I've read uh, the Gospel of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, and uh, which is a record of his talks. But I've never been to Calcutta. I've never spent time in any of his uh, centers. Although I've visited the Vedanta Center in Hollywood several times. 
w- was your interest in Vivekananda and, and Ramakrishna the result of your at all your proximity to Calcutta there, or I mean, how, how is it that you didn't find yourself focusing on Ramana Maharshi or you know Nisargadatta Maharaj or any other you know more more modern exponent of Advaita at that point? But you're right; it, it's partly exposure, I guess, because my parents were closely associated with the Ramakrishna mission. They were initiated devotees. And we had a big ashram pretty close to our house in Bhuvaneshwar, mm-hmm. so which I used to go to with my parents. So that explains part of it. And of course, the literature, the books were there at home. I didn't know much about Raman Maharshi at all. I'd vaguely heard his name, but I didn't know much about it until much later. And also part of it was the what they were saying, Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, and others in the, in the movement. It sounded a very very logical. It sounded very inclusive. It sounded very compatible with modern values and science. So all of that, it ticked all the boxes for me, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's uh, my approach to this topic has been somewhat idiosyncratic, just based on my experience studying in various traditions and spending time on retreat and, and integrating what has always seemed to me to be the the highest wisdom of the Indian and Buddhist traditions uh, in ways that the purists in those traditions would, I think, generally want to resist integration. I, you know, I, I think if you talk to most Buddhists, even most Buddhists who are teaching their version of a, of a non-dual approach to practice, and, and here I, I think you find it mostly in the Tibetan tradition among Dzogchen teachers and, and uh, uh, Mahamudra teachers, Although uh, there, there are certainly uh, non-dual approaches to Zen as well. Or if you talk to exponents of Advaita, I mean, correct me if, if this has not been your experience, but uh, you know, certainly on the Buddhist side, I would say that very few Buddhists will want to say, well, yeah, they're, we're, they're teaching precisely the same thing. And, and there's something confusing about the Indian Advaitic emphasis on uh, or you know, retention of the word self, you know, capital S, to name the underlying reality, whereas in Buddhism there's an emphasis on on no self or the illusoriness of the self or the underlying reality being emptiness. And so there's a negation in Buddhism and, and, a, and a positive affirmation or, or seeming affirmation of a, a reality uh, on the, the nominally Hindu side of the Indian tradition. And most people in each of those traditions seem to still assert some kind of sectarian difference, but I've never felt that that difference could, in the end, be true. I just think it just seems to me that you take someone like Ramana Maharshi and someone like, you know, to pick a Tibetan at random, Longchenpa, though they're using slightly different framings to describe this ultimate experience, it just seems to me that they, they must be talking about the same experience. And, and I certainly have been led to my own experience of these things by both ways of describing the nature of mind, uh, and have fa- found them both useful. Although I, I tend to emphasize the Buddhist negation more than anything else. So anyway, I just I know you've you've gone over the same ground in your own contemplation of these things. So I, I'm wondering if you see the matter differently in any way, or if, if you've unified both ways of talking in in your uh, thinking about these things. Yeah, to begin with, I think we agree substantially on this point about the purists on both sides. You're absolutely right. I can speak from the Advaita side, from the Advaita side or from the Vedantic side. In fact, there are multiple schools of Vedanta, but we are here primarily concerned with the Advaita Vedanta or the non-dual Vedanta. Mm. But all of these Vedantic schools are uh, unanimous in general in, uh, in refuting and rejecting Buddhist schools. And uh, one must remember that the Hindu schools and the Buddhist schools had a long history, really very long, and nearly a thousand years of debate there are on these issues. So the Buddhists rejected an immortal soul, a concept of a god, and the Hindus defended an immortal Atman and uh, Ishwara or God. And there were numerous different differences epistemologically and so on. So about a thousand years of debate, 
which is um, all very good. I think, I mean, if you ask who won the debate, it depends on whom you ask. But <laughs> I think what... Well, the, the, the what Muslims... Really won the de- <laughs> That's true. That's, you're right. In fact, I was just thinking, I, I once visited Oxford University and they showed me a Balliol College. That was the first college uh, in uh, Oxford University. Actually, it started as a, as a monastery, but it was in the late 13th century. And it just struck me that when the great Nalanda University in North India was being raised by Muslim invaders, Bhakti, Arkelji, and others, exactly around that time. And that's when the first great universities in the, in the West uh, mm-hmm. started, actually. Yeah. yeah, you're right. So I think one clear winner was philosophy, Indian philosophy, because philosophy really developed because of this long, protracted debate. Epistemology, philosophical language, uh, precision, all of that flowered. Now, from the Advaita perspective, they criticize the Buddhists as being nihilists, you know, who do say that nothing exists. And that's not a position that can be taken seriously. They, uh, they dismiss it. From the Buddhist side, they dismiss the Advaita in common with all the other Hindu schools as defending an eternal separate existence called an Atman. And they show why this is not possible. I remember. Once I was giving this talk in Delhi University, something in, in the psychology department, you know, the Advaita view of consciousness. And then there was this Buddhist Lama, a Tibetan Buddhist Lama, who g- gave the Tibetan Buddhist view of consciousness. Afterwards, in the Q&A session, this lady stood up and asked the Lama and me, but, um, don't you think both of you were speaking about the same thing? And the Lama sort of hesitated. They're very sweet. Mm-hmm. So they disagree with you, but yeah, yeah. they'll do so very sweetly. They yeah. said, not quite the same. It's different. And I said, yes, it's like different paths leading up to the same mountain top. And then the Lama chimed in and said, yes, to the same mountain top, but then again different after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very Tibetan. Yeah, it's hilarious. So, yes. But when we look closely at uh, the Advaita Vedanta conclusions, both metaphysical, epistemological, and regarding the ultimate nature of things, and the the Dzogchen, the conclusions in Dzogchen, uh, you cannot deny that they are very similar. I remember the first time I heard about Tibetan Buddhism, I was a young novice in our main monastery in India, on the bank of the Ganga near Calcutta, and I came across this book in our library by Professor T. R. V. Murthy, the book is The Central Philosophy of Buddhism, mm-hmm. yeah. where he talks about Nagarjuna, yes. And I was fascinated. It's like looking at your face in the mirror. It's not exactly the same, but they're like <laughs> mirror images. And the closer I looked at it, the more it seemed to me that they are both based on the same central intuition, understanding about our, our nature, understanding of the nature of consciousness. But they have come at it from different perspectives and different, they have developed through different growths of philosophical traditions. So, yeah, uh, that was my, my feeling. One of our senior monks writing about this issue, he just says that what the Buddhists call shunyam, the void, we call purnam, the full or the whole mm-hmm. or the infinite. And recently I had time to, uh, had the occasion to study. Indo Tibetan Madhyamaka Buddhism with Professor Jay Garfield. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I've spoken to him. You interviewed yeah. him. Yeah. Yes. He's right. Right. Uh, he was teaching at Harvard University, at Harvard Divinity School. I had heard about him and his, heard uh, about his works. And so I signed up for that course. And at the end of it, I think I appreciated the differences. I mean, when I entered the class, he clearly told me, Swami, keep your Advaita Vedanta outside the door. And that was wise, because then, then you can appreciate uh, Madhyamaka Buddhism in its own light, in its, in its you know, own glory. So at the end of that course, I had a better appreciation of the differences between Advaita Vedanta and Madhyamaka Buddhism. But I still can't help but say that I see them as methodological differences, sort of pointing towards the same conclusion. Uh, and the same realization. Sometimes they put it this way, that there is a way of misunderstanding Advaita Vedanta and there's a way of misunderstanding Madhyamaka Buddhism. The way of misunderstanding Advaita Vedanta is to think that, that Advaita is talking about something, that something called Atman or Brahman. 
And the way to misunderstand Madhyamaka Buddhism is that it's talking about nothing. But both of them are actually talking about no thing, you know, no hyphen thing. Mm -hmm. The consciousness is not an object among many other objects. Sort of, yeah, that's what I would like to say. Yeah, well, so I haven't spoken about Madhyamaka much here, and I, I've tended to not focus on it personally because it, as a method, it has always seemed somewhat less than helpful from my point of view. I mean, as a philosophical position of you know really not taking a position, you know, merely not asserting anything and, and observing the the partiality and incompleteness of every other school's assertions, I, it strikes me as a you know, very well-defended uh, view, because again, you're really, it, it, it's quite similar to the Greek tradition of, of skepticism that um, started with Pyrrho, but it, the, the Majamaka is more sophisticated in just how it has worked out every, and we, it, we, we, have just, we have more of the literature in the first place, but it's more sophisticated in that it's united with a a view of, of enlightenment that you can't quite find in the same way among the Greeks. But it's a similar position of just, you know, bracketing everything with this kind of skepticism that points to the limitations of concepts, right? Whenever you describe something, your, 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 your mere effort to encapsulate it by concepts is bound to fail if you're talking about ultimate reality. And I mean, perhaps we could run through some of what Madhyamaka is as it gets expressed by people like Nagarjuna and, and Chandrakirti. And, and there, or, there are precursors to it even in the, in the Theravada tradition with the, like the questions of King Melinda. I don't know if you know that text, but it's a very similar analysis of a, of a chariot that shows you that you know, a chariot can't exist without its parts, but chariotness can't exist in its parts. You can imagine a chariot without a door, but you can't imagine a chariot without a door, without wheels, without an axle, without... You take away all the parts, there's no chariot, but you combine the parts, there's no chariotness in, in any of the parts. And so it becomes inscrutable what a chariot is. It becomes clear that there's no independent existence of, uh, that is essentially a chariot. Uh, it becomes this you know, mere conceptual designation on, a, you know, on relationships. And so it is with a human being and a self and you know, anything that you might want to concretize as a as a something and so but madhyamaka as an approach has always seemed to me to be this very you know scholarly and you know ironically too conceptual path of analysis of, of just thinking of a kind of exhausting thought you know about this topic whereas there you know in my experience there's a much more direct way to just observe that there is no thing, right? There is no self as you thought there was in the middle of experience. There's just experience, and when experience has no center, it, it has this inscrutable, unconditioned, undefined, open quality about which very little can be said in the end, and yet it is, it is the condition in which everything you can possibly experience appears. And so I Madhyamaka has not been my focus, but I, you know, I agree that it all sounds right when you begin running through its assertions and, and non-assertions, but it's, um, it does stand over and against these other Tibetan traditions like the Dzogchen and Mahamudra, which are more directly non-conceptual and experiential and still have this opposite quality of emphasizing the negative, you know, certainly more than uh, Advaita Vedanta does, but yeah, you know they 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 get criticized by other Tibetan schools like Madhyamaka for being too assertive of the positive. I mean, they talk about Buddha nature, they talk about the Dharmakaya, they talk about you know Rigpa, non, you know, non-dual awareness, in ways that seem, at moments, certainly recklessly assertive of a an almost uh, you know Brahman-like reality uh, that is left when you get rid of all duality and. Um, Nobody in that tradition would want to hear me say that, but that that is a it's just at, at the end of the day, it really begins to seem like we're parsing words once you get to the other side of this primary illusion of subject object duality. Well, yes, I in fact 
think exactly the same thing about, uh, say, Dzogchen and Mahamudra. It seems to point to the same intuitive realization of the consciousness nature or the pure being nature of, of the self. Mm. But what you are saying reminded me of this book. Somebody recommended to me, it. I found it very useful, Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness by a Lama, where uh, he takes up this concept of the void of emptiness and starts with the Theravada interpretation and then he goes on to the Yogacara interpretation, the, the, mm. you know, the subjective idealists. And then he goes on to the two Madhyamaka interpretations, the Swatantrika and then the Prasangika. That's usually where Madhyamaka stops, the Prasangika Madhyamaka, because that's taken as the supreme development of, uh, of Buddhist thought in Tibetan philosophy. But here, this particular Lama, he goes on to talk about the last, the fifth understanding, or the sort of final understanding of emptiness. Uh, I think it's the Jonang school or something, which, which sounds very much like uh, Advaita Vedanta. You know, like limitless consciousness being the mm -hmm. Buddha nature, and that is directly realizable by, by Dzogchen or Mahamudra uh, inquiry. Somebody told me that something similar like that is there in Chinese Mahayana, but I don't know much about Chinese Mahayana. I'm not, not much at all, actually. Mm. So this is where I find the closeness between Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. Philosophically, the sort of final developments of Prasangika, Madhyamaka, on the negative side, because they would never ever make a commitment which Advaita freely makes about the ultimate reality being pure being or pure consciousness. But then the Dzogchen, the Mahamudra, you know, developments, they seem to mirror the Advaitic, um, uh, Advaitic uh, analysis. The chariot example, that's interesting because one of, in fact, my final assignment in Professor Garfield's class was to defend the Advaita position against, against Madhyamaka, against Chandrakirti, in fact. Mm -hmm. Chandrakirti takes the chariot example and shows the seven ways in which there is no chariot, so and applies that to this, you know, the seven ways in which you you cannot find a self, and so I, I call that paper Chandrakirti's ch uh, chariot, and Garfield actually liked it. He said it's a solid defense, uh, showing how the uh, Advaita thesis actually escapes the Madhyamaka net. Let me show what I mean by the similarity between the Advaita understanding of the self and uh, Madhyamaka, or let's say the Madhyamaka and Dzogchen mm. understanding of, of ultimate reality or, or the lack of ultimate reality. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, so Advaita Vedanta is based on the Upanishads, so the, the root texts. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, in the second chapter, there is an analysis of the self. And it starts off by saying that the self is limitless consciousness existence. In Sanskrit, satyam jnanam anantam brahma. So brahman, the word literally means the vast, the limitless. So brahman is this, anantam, limitless. Does this get, and, Swamiji, does this get abbreviated to Satchitananda? Ultimately it does, yeah. existence, consciousness, bliss. Yeah. But this is one of the earliest formulations. So they say that brahman or the ultimate reality or the self is limitless existence consciousness. Mm. The ananda, the bliss aspect, again comes in another part of the same Upanishad. But in later formulations, the most popular way of describing the Advaitic self is sat chit ananda, mm. existence absolute, bliss uh, consciousness absolute, and bliss absolute. So in that analysis, what they do is they ask you, what do you think you are? Show us what you think you are. And so we start with the most obvious thing which we identify the self with, with the body. Now you can see very close parallel with the Buddhist idea of the five aggregates and how the Advaita analysis, uh, the Vedantic analysis, dismisses those five aggregates as, you know, that they are not the self, no combination of the self is, there, is the self. So it shows, first of all, how, why the body cannot be the self. And then the Upanishad says, all right, investigate further, something subtler, something deeper than the body. So it comes to prana, breath, and shows why that cannot be the self. And it's a very logical analysis, you know. Uh, what you consider to be the self is lasting, and this is not lasting. That seems to be unchanging. This seems to be changing. This seems to be an object of consciousness, whereas you are conscious or you are aware of it, and the object and the subject cannot be the same. Mm. For multiple reasons, 
the body is not the self. When you look inwards, the prana, the breath is not the self. Look further inwards, you find the mind, thoughts, emotions. Again, for this very, very much the same reasons, they cannot be the self. You look further inward, you find the inquiring intellect, the very intelligence which is doing this kind of an analysis. And that too is subject to you know, change and um, coming and going. It's an object of awareness and so on. And it goes on like this. It discovers progressively five subtler and inner uh, levels of what was considered the self and shows that none of them can be the self. And very interestingly, the Upanishad leaves you hanging there. It does not provide an answer with, now we are going to show you the self, you know, in like a, those Russian nesting dolls. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say so. It just shows you that a final candidate which you put forward for being the self is not the self. And then it keeps quiet. And the student asks, so the self doesn't exist? And the teacher says, if the self didn't exist, you wouldn't exist. But you do exist. So in that case, what are you? I mean, first you exhaust every possible candidate of the self. And then you deny that the self is nothing. So then what is it? And then it leaves you there. And then, of course, the, it points towards the self being consciousness itself. So there you see a very similar analysis to the Buddhist five aggregates not being the self. Yeah, so I, I think there, there's a, a distinction we should make between levels of illusion here, because you know I, I've often said that um, to say that the self is an illusion is not the same thing as saying that people are illusions. There's a level at which you take the whole person, you take the body and the mind, uh, we could play the same game of conceptual analysis with it that uh, Nagarjuna or Chandrakirti or earlier still in the Theravada canon, the uh, perhaps apocryphal Saint uh, Nagasena played with a chariot, right? You can say is a person in, in the hands, in the head, in the feet, in the shoulders, in the, in the cells of the liver. And it would seem that a person doesn't quite exist. There's no essential person-ness. It's, it's a mere designation upon person parts, right? And this, this is both true spatially, it's true temporally, when you look at how, these, how the, the material constituents of a person change over time. Uh, we're constantly replacing our atoms, it, 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 you know, moment by moment. So that there's that, and yet, as a matter of convention, people obviously exist, and it's not fundamentally mysterious that I wake up with my memories and not your memories. I mean, it's, it's just this, that we can talk about people without feeling like we're delusional. But the self that most people think they have, the feeling of I, the feeling that there's a me in the middle of experience, the feeling that there's a thinker in addition to the flow of thought, that is an illusion of a different sort, right? That is, that is something that you can find to be absent in a way that you, you don't quite find people to be absent. Again, you can perceive people from the point of view of non-duality or, or a, a type of awareness that emphasizes emptiness, and, and there's a kind of an, an, an inscrutability to what is left, but it's not quite the same thing as looking for the center of experience and recognize you know, the eye in the middle and recognizing that no such one exists and then resting as that condition that no longer feels that there's a center. I get, you know, feel free to disagree here, but it strikes me that there are two levels of deconstruction that we're that people are in danger of of confusing. I mean, we, we can talk about the emptiness of everything, including, you know, emptiness itself. We can talk about how people and things have no inherent existence, but that's not quite the same thing as the stronger experiential claim that the self, as it's generally felt to exist, doesn't exist. You're right. In fact. One of the main themes in that course, which I did under uh, Professor Garfield, was the doctrine of the conventional self. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the debates in Madhyamaka were about the nature of the conventional self, how this inquiry into what we are. In fact, I don't even like to say who we are, because who seems like a person. It's rather an inquiry into what we are. So it shouldn't end up 
sounding ludicrous, you know, like dismissing our existence altogether. So there is a good deal of Tibetan Madhyamaka dialectics which goes on to develop a robust sense of the conventional self. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to see almost the same thing happening in Advaita. Both of these, I mean, on the surface, rival philosophies, you know, and sort of final developments of philosophy in two rival systems, the Hindu systems and the Buddhist systems, and sort of at their acme end up with Madhyamaka and Advaita. And they are so similar. For example, speaking to what you just said about the conventional self, there is uh, the two truths. Both of them make a great deal about there being a conventional truth and an ultimate truth. And uh, I think Nagarjuna got there first. Uh, he says that uh, without taking the help of conventional truth, nobody comes to the ultimate truth. Mm. In Advaita Vedanta, there is a Vavaharika, transactional truth, empirical truth, and there is a Paramarthika, there is an absolute truth, which are ex ex almost the exact words used by, the, by Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and in Tibetan translation also. So yes, nobody is trying to deny, and one should not, one should be very clear that there is a person who is doing uh, Madhyamaka or Advaita, the person who is walking around talking and holding a job or be running a, a monastery or whatever. So that person exists at that level. It's all valid. And so the two levels of truth, uh, they, they come in here. Another startling similarity, when you, you just mentioned things like emptiness and then emptiness of emptiness, in Advaita Vedanta, there's a whole parallel discussion of mithyatva, which is the falsity, the appearance nature of things. And then there's also mithyatva of mithyatva, the falsity of falsity. You can see sort of a mirror effect here, you know, in both of these developments. I think what's going on here is there is an inquiry, the, the claim in, um, in Advaita, the Taittiri Upanishad, which I just referred to earlier, actually the section starts off with, with this cryptic statement, Brahma vidapnoti param, the knower of Brahman attains the highest. And that sort of sets out the whole project. I mean, there are three aspects to this, that there is something to be known. What is at the surface is not the final truth. So there is something to be known. And knowing that sort of is the goal of human life, you attain the highest, which is transcendence of sorrow and attainment of fulfillment. So that sets it out. And then you have these questions to be answered. What is the ultimate truth? How would you know this ultimate truth? And how does this help you to solve your life's problems? So in this quest, it's an inquiry. We deconstruct our surface assumptions about ourselves. So that's the deconstruction of the apparent self. And that can lead to immediate misunderstanding that Advaita or you know, Madhyamaka is saying that the, con the person is not there. So they take pains to reaffirm that the person is very much there. In all conventional sense, it's there. Everything is functional. Everything works. Just that we are making a deeper uh, metaphysical inquiry, the result of which will be again apparent at the conventional level. You attain to peace and you uh, go beyond sorrow. You are able to live your life much, much better, more peacefully than before and so on. I don't know if that spoke to what you were yeah. saying. Let's um. We've we've uh, deluged our listeners with doctrinal distinctions and and similarities. <laughs> Let's jump in to the the other side of the pool here, which is the experience and how it relates to the the mitigation of psychological suffering. Perhaps you could briefly summarize how, you know how you think about that question. Just for like, oh, what practical value is it? to uh, understand any of these things and to pay attention to them. But then perhaps you can guide me and, and our listeners in you know, five minutes or so of, of a, a meditative inquiry. There's like a, there are people who, there are two groups of people who are, who are very likely listening to us now. There are those who know exactly what we're talking about and uh, actually can experience you know, what I generally refer to as non-dual mindfulness whenever they want, and they just, you know, that when, they, when they pay attention and when they're no longer distracted by thought, the reality of the nature of mind or, or the capital S self or how, whatever term we want to use is what remains for them. But for most people, I think, they're deeply interested in these questions, but they're still struggling to glimpse 
the nature of mind beyond the feeling of self. They, they feel that you know, they are the meditator. They are the one who is witnessing thoughts and sensations arise and change and pass away. And generally speaking, it's from a, the point of view of feeling like a, a spotlight of conscious attention in their heads, uh, that, that can, and they can aim their attention at an object of meditation, whether it's the breath or a sound or sensations, or you know, if they're practicing in some other tradition familiar to you, they might be using a mantra, right? So they're, they're, but they have a relationship between the subject, uh, the witness, which they feel themselves to be, and everything that can be witnessed. And so the sticking point will be everything we have said and will tend to say about the reality prior to this being somehow non-dual, that you know, the subject-object distinction is the thing to be experientially you know, overcome or, or seen beyond as the practice of meditation matures. So perhaps you could take a few minutes and just uh, lead us in, in some kind of inquiry which would be targeting that second group of people who are just confused, frankly, about what is meant by non-duality. Right, right. All right. I'll do two things. One, very quickly, I think it's always helpful before setting out on this journey to see exactly what is being promised here, yeah. to be clear about it. And I love this story about the Buddha when the, you know, the Buddha was teaching, he has already a Sangha of monks. And so well into his advanced years, a monk comes to him, one of his disciples, and says, I have this question. What's the question? The question is, you said that there is sorrow, and sorrow is old age, disease, death. We know the story of how the Buddha became the Buddha. The prince Siddhartha saw this old person, diseased person, and a dead person. And so these are some of the most significant sources of suffering in our, our life, old age, disease, death. So suffering is there. And you inquired into whether it's possible to overcome suffering. And you claim that you have found a way of overcoming suffering. So the Buddha says, so what's the question? And the question is that we are your followers and we are doing whatever you told us to do. But we are getting old. And some of us are already dead. You are getting old too. And all of us, we get disease once in a while. So how did we overcome suffering? And more to the point, how did you overcome suffering? You claim to have overcome suffering and yet you are getting old, you get disease, presumably you'll die soon. So this actually points to you know, something that one should clear up before we enter into mm -hmm. any kind of advanced spiritual practice. The Buddha's answer was simple and direct. He said, imagine a person uh, hit by an arrow and then hit by a second arrow. He, the, the shock or pain of the first arrow and then the terrible suffering of the second arrow. Well, the first arrow is what the world throws at you. All kinds of problems in the world, problems in the body like old age and disease and death, problems in the mind consequent upon all the problems in the world and the body. It all comes to the mind finally. All of that is the first arrow and it causes suffering. But the second arrow is our reaction to it. And the Buddha's claim, and I think that's, it's very solid that our whole reaction to it constitutes the bulk of our suffering. Mm. Yes, it's unpleasant to get a disease, but the real suffering is uh, how we react to it. And I think every doctor, especially you know, ER doctors and all, they know how different patients react vastly differently to maybe the same kind of problem and how a patient will face terminal illness with dignity and calmness and therefore with much less psychological suffering. And another patient might face a paper cut with, uh, <laughs> with uh, you know, like it's mm. a disaster or something, and therefore suffering much more psychologically. Then the Buddha says that what I have taught you will remove the suffering caused by the second arrow. About the first arrow, I cannot do much. So, uh, <laughs> so th this is what is being promised here, mm. that a complete an entire change in our attitude to our experience of life, and that will remove our suffering. Of course, there's metaphysics which shows that if you attain that enlightenment, then you go beyond the cycle of births and deaths, and therefore the suffering caused by the first arrow will eventually uh, cease, and all of that. We can, but we can put it aside for the time being. What is directly being promised is a complete end to psychological suffering and attainment of psychological fulfillment. All right.
So that was the first part. Now, what does something like Advaita Vedanta say about it? Here, it's good to know that there are different approaches to spiritual life. So, for example, the most common approach to spiritual life is a theistic approach, which people in different religions are familiar with, you know, those which are theistic religions, that there is a God and there is, if you take refuge in God, you believe in God and you know, surrender to God, then you will go beyond sorrow, attain fulfillment and so on and so forth. And that's the path of faith or belief that clearly you can't start with questioning there. It won't work. Eventually, it might work. It might take you beyond suffering, give you peace. There is, in distinction to the path of belief or faith, there is what is, might be called the yogic path. And bear with me a little bit here. This distinction is important uh, because I'm trying to show the uniqueness of what Advaita Vedanta proposes. Mm -hmm. The yogic path says, not faith. I'm going to show you how, by the yogic path, I mean the Patanjali yoga, and which shares mm -hmm. a lot in common with Buddhistic practices. So I'm going to show you certain practices. You're going to experience this for yourself. It's going to be experiential. It's going to be empirical. I'll show you how to sit, how to breathe, how some basic ethical practices, then how to focus. And then you will see for yourself that you are not the body, you're not the mind, you are limitless awareness, and then you go beyond suffering. So this is the yogic path. It's a path of in the, in the belief path, the problem is lack of belief, lack of faith. The solution is faith, belief, surrender. In the yogic path, the problem is, let's say, restlessness of the mind. And the Yoga Sutra says that the method is calming down the mind. A peaceful mind is the solution. Now, in distinction to these is the Advaitic path, where it says not so much a matter of faith, not even a matter of experience. This is something that many people miss. Not even a matter of experience. Mm. But it's a matter of knowledge and ignorance. There is a reality which we are missing every moment. And the whole effort is to point out this reality, to get knowledge of this reality. And the, no the way to get knowledge is inquiry. In Sanskrit, there's a word, vichara, inquiry. And to develop insight into how things are. And that insight sets you free. Not so much faith in a deity, not even so much extraordinary mystical experiences. This is the problem with extra, you know, let me just go a little out of the way here. And, you know, when I say the problem with faith is in this day and age, you're going to run up against Sam Harris and Christopher mm -hmm. Hitchens and Richard Dawkins. And, you know, sometimes I say to people who are interested in Advaita that uh, first a good dose of uh, Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, it clear your mind. <laughs> and then you, uh, then I'm, uh, Advaita I'm happy to hear better. it. <laughs> no, I, I strongly recommend it, actually. Mm. And then the yogi's reply to that would be, right, right, we are not asking you to believe. The yogi says, I will give you these extraordinary mystical experiences which will prove to you the claims of what I'm saying, that you are infinite consciousness, not body, not mind, and so on, or one with the universe or whatever. The problem there would be, a neuroscientist, a psychiatrist would come and say, look, I don't deny that you are having these extraordinary experiences which you call mystical experiences. But the thing is, it's because of something in your brain. Some of these neurons are firing. Maybe your brain is, you're having a stroke uh, or maybe um, you're high on, what's that, that psilocybin, I think, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> or a magic mushroom or something. And that's making you feel that you're not actually one with the universe. You're not actually not, not body, not mind. It's just you that we don't deny you feel that way, but it's just a feeling. It doesn't have uh, any relevance to the truth claims. And that's the yeah. objection, you know, a, a neuroscientist might raise. And that's not new. Notice how mystics were treated throughout the centuries. The usual reaction was uh, they're crazy. They're mad. Because those experiences are special experiences. They are not commonly shared experiences, nor are they understandable in common sense or science. So one can dismiss them. Well, without dismissing the, the experience, one can dismiss the claims made on the basis of that mm -hmm. experience. This is where I think Advaita Vedanta and also uh, the Madhyamaka, Yogachara based uh, Dzogchen, they have, an, they have something very important to say, but it's subtle. That's why a lot of people miss it. What Advaita Vedanta says is not faith, not even extraordinary mystical experiences, but 
just our day-to-day experience, our quotidian experience of being a subject and experiencing objects, our day-to-day experience of you know, waking, dreaming, deep sleep. This is enough to start with. And we use these experiences to make a philosophical inquiry and see for ourselves what the true nature of consciousness is. And the interesting thing here is, you will not come to a theoretical conclusion because consciousness is direct and immediate for us. Whatever we discover about consciousness, that's an experience. That's experiential by its very definition. So, so that's the, the second point I wanted to make. The yeah. first point was what is being claimed in spiritual life. The Buddha said the second arrow. That's what we are talking about. And here, I'm making a case for the special methodology of Advaita Vedanta. In fact, even Sankhya philosophy in ancient India had the same insight. And I would argue also the Dzogchen or the Mahamudra approach. Uh, the Dzogchen and Mahamudra approach, it synthesizes meditation and inquiry. From my reading, mm-hmm. both of them are there very beautifully uh, fused together. All right. If this is fine, uh, then yeah, let wonderful. me go into an actual inquiry. Yeah. yeah, please. All right. So with this in background, there are multiple such inquiries called vicharas given in Advaita Vedanta. My favorite is what is called the, the Drig Drishya Viveka, the, the discernment of the seer and the seen. So what we will do here is we, we are asked to listen to the instructions. That's one. Second, understand the instructions so that I can say, okay, I get what you are saying. And third, see for yourself, you know, ask the question, is it real? Is it a fact? Or is it, does it sound philosophical, theoretical? So just three things. Listen, understand. And see, see for yourself, like, is it a living fact right now? I'm, I'm sort of uh, simplifying the three steps in Advaita Vedanta of, of hearing and contemplation and meditation. In Sanskrit, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. And very much the same methodology in Tibetan Buddhism also. You're supposed to uh, hear and study and then uh, reason it out and then you know, meditate upon it. All right, here goes. I'm using a text, a pointer from a medieval text called Drig Drishya Viveka, written about 700 years ago. Probably, the author is not known, but probably it is Vidyaranya who lived in the south of India about 700 years ago in the Vijayanagar kingdom. So just for my own use, I mean, for my own comfort, I'll chant the Sanskrit and mm-hmm. then translate. Great. Rupam Drishyam Lochanam Drik Tad Drishyam Drik Manasam Drishya Dhivrittaya Sakshi Drigeva Natu Drishyate. What it means is that um, forms are seen, the eyes are the seer. The eyes are seen, the mind is the seer. The mind is seen, the witness is the seer. The witness is never seen. And it stops there. So, what do you do with this? Hmm. First, we will use let's say, an operating principle that the subject and the object must be different. The seer and the seen must be different. And this is sort of accepted in philosophy that uh, self-reflexivity is not allowed. It, you know, thing doesn't operate upon itself. So you are the seer. That's because that's what it feels like. And whatever you see is an object. It's the seen. Now, the goal is to find out what are you exactly. We start off by feeling I am this body, this mind. And yes, I'm aware, I'm conscious also. But this bundle, and I've never really reflected upon it. Now, this, this, is, this pointer makes me reflect upon it. So it goes in four steps. Step one, I see that I can see color and shape all around me. Those are forms. And they're all being seen by the eyes. Clearly, the eyes are different from the, the color and the forms and the shapes, whatever, they, whatever is seen. So that's the first point. The eyes are different from the form. The seer is different from the seen. And again, just by the way, we notice that uh, the seen are many. We see so many things, so many people, so many sights, but they're all seen by the same pair of eyes. And the third thing we notice is that the seen keep changing. Uh, I saw something a little while earlier, I'm seeing something now, and very soon I'll see something else. But the same pair of eyes is constant in all these different scenery. So the seer and the seen are different. The seen are many, the seer is the same, one, and the seen are continuously changing, but the seer relatively. 
And this is a very naive way of beginning slowly. This is step one. So we say, all right, and ask the same questions. What were the instructions? And did I get it? Yes. And is it a fact? And we'll say, yes, yes, all of this is pretty evident. Now we go to the second step. The second step is the eyes are seen and the mind is now the seer. So when I consider the eyes, I'm aware of closing the eyes. I'm aware of opening the eyes. I'm aware of seeing very well or not seeing that I need glasses. So in that sense, the eyes are seen, seen within quotes. Mm. It's the eyes are known. Yeah. And what knows the eyes? The mind knows the eyes. Now, immediately, those things we are asked to observe, that the mind is clearly different from the eyes. The eyes are a physical organ and the mind, whatever it is, clearly not like the eyes. And yet the mind knows the eyes. And then we also notice that the eyes and all the other sense organs, their inputs, they are many and their inputs are many and varied, but it's the same mind which receives all of them. And third, uh, the eyes and the ears and the skin and all of them, they keep changing, the inputs keep changing. And the mind, though the mind keeps changing, its mind keeps changing into more mind. So in sort of in a, in a simple way, we can say that the seer and the scene are different and uh, the scene is many and the seer is one and the scene keeps changing and the seer does not change. Now we go further. The mind itself, when we contemplate the mind, introspect, we see thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, even the sense of I, the ego. It's very interesting in Sanskrit, the ego is not taken as the real I. So the ego is just a construct in the mind. It's, a, it's defined, it's got a specific definition. Abhiman Atmika Antak Karana Vritti, which means the appropriating function of the mind. So the mind does lots of things. And there's one of the things it does is to unite all of it into a seeming self. And so it helps it to function as an individual. So that uniting factor, appropriating factor, is called the ego. Mm. And all of this is a flow in the mind. It arises, disappears, moves around. And yet it is all experienced. I have to say that I, introspection is a real thing. I can uh, clearly uh, experience the contents of my mind. And so the mind is the scene. And whatever is experiencing the mind by our initial principle that the seer and the scene must be different, it must be in some sense different from the mind. And we see that the mind is, there are many kinds of thoughts, feelings, emotions, but all of them appear to consciousness. And consciousness doesn't seem to be of many kinds, this witness. And then the mind is continuously changing. But if you put change on the side of the mind, then the witnessing consciousness does not seem to be changing. So the seer is not changing. The seer is one. The scene are many. And the seer and the scene are different. Now this seer, just label it the witness, because not in the sense of witnessing, but in the sense of, let's say, illumination, that the first person experiencing in that sense. And then it, the fourth stage of this verse is that the seer is never seen. So the seer, this consciousness, this witness, why am I calling it consciousness? Because obviously it's, there is experience, there is first person experience. So it, I am conscious. Whatever it is that I am, I must be conscious. So this consciousness is never an object. So one does not try to objectify and see consciousness as an object. You know, this immediate tendency is, oh, so there is something separate from the mind. I am this witness consciousness. So what am I like? Never ask that question because you'll never ever be able to objectify it. It's because if you objectify it, then who is the subject? So you are ever the subject, never the object. So this is the first step in Advaita Vedanta, to isolate consciousness, this witness consciousness, in our understanding and see that it's always there. I mean, one interesting consequence of this is, notice that this consciousness is what powers all of our first-person experiences. Seeing. If I, don't, if I close my eyes, I won't see, but I'm still aware. Thinking. If I stop thinking or, um, you know, in meditation or just blank mind, uh, I space out. The mind is spaced out, but I'm still aware. But if we can even consider this awareness being switched off somehow, then everything else would disappear. There would be no seeing, no thinking, uh, no remembering, no loving, hating, nothing. No problem, no Advaita, no Buddhism, nothing. So this consciousness is pure. That's why it's called pure consciousness. Pure, not in the sense of a good consciousness, 
pure, um, you know, but in the sense of just consciousness, mm. just bare awareness. That's supposed to be our real nature. That's what's called the Atman. Now, there is an ancient philosophy called Sankhya, kind of a precursor to Advaita Vedanta, which stops there. So it stops at a consciousness and non-consciousness, consciousness matter duality. Mm-hmm. And it stops there and it says that the ultimate nature of the universe is there is material universe called Prakriti, which is matter, energy, whatever mm-hmm. you have, and also consciousness, which is also part of reality. And there are these two kinds of realities which interact. So a, a dualism, not mind-matter dualism, but a kind of consciousness and uh, matter dualism. Advaita Vedanta goes further. We'll talk about that later because that's, uh, you know, to establish non-duality, one has to ask the question, what relationship do these appearances, whatever appears to consciousness, what relationship do they bear to consciousness? If you, mm. uh, I think I'll just stop here and see what you have got for me. But this is something that we can go on to, you know, that that's where real non-duality is established. How do you get from here to consciousness alone? You know, without yeah. uh, without a second. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. I, I would like us to to go there directly. I, the, the one thing I would add, which really is just a, an emphasis on the point you made, it, one of the implications of the logical distance between the knower and the known, or the seer and the seen. Uh, you know, the knower cannot be the known, and vice versa. Is that you can see logically. Uh, this is a, a you know, granted, this is not the same thing as experiencing it to be so, but you can, by logic, you can carve out a space for this experience. You can see logically that consciousness can't feel like a self. It can't feel like I, because whatever the feeling of I is, whatever the, the signature of, of separateness is, well, you know, whatever, whatever footprint the, the ego has in the mind and body, all of that, whether it's energy, whether it's you know something more inscrutable, just anything that can be noticed as a feeling of self, that has to be an object that is known from some prior point, which is not, you know, by definition, not confined to it. It's prior to it. It's transcendent of it. So it, it would be natural to expect, to be by this analysis, that the pure consciousness, the pure knowing function, can't in and of itself feel the constraint of I-ness or selfness or egoity. Uh, rather, uh, you know, everything that, that is giving rise to the experience of selfness is itself an appearance in consciousness. Absolutely. You know, at this point, the Buddhist might say, well, if this is what you call the self, it's clearly not a self at all. Hmm. I mean, this is not the way we use the word self. You are using the word self in an entirely different way now. And I would tend to agree, absolutely. So this witness consciousness, this bare awareness, it is quite unlike a self, which is you know a common sense understanding, whether upon inquiry or without inquiry, just a day-to-day understanding of the self. This bare awareness is vastly different from our uh, conception of a self. Now, the Buddhist would be perfectly within his right to say that I would call this the non-self. And uh, I, I think there is no problem if you call this the non-self. What the Advaitin, Advaitin does is very phenomenological. You are searching for who or what you are. And as you inquire, whatever seems to be part of your identity, uh, you begin to see that it is exterior to your identity. The body, the breath, emotions, thoughts perceptions, even the intellect which is doing Advaita, and beyond that what is called the, the causal self or you know, the darkness, the potential darkness we, sort of, we experience in deep sleep or in, in coma or whatever it is, all of those are objects to consciousness, to bare awareness. Now if you ask this person who is doing this inquiry, so this bare awareness which you ended up with, this witness consciousness, are you that? Or is that something other than you? We would immediately say, I am that. If anything else, I am that. If nothing else, I am that. And everything else is an sort of an overlay or a superimposition upon me. So it's in that sense that the Advaitin would say, that is the self with a capital S. Mm-hmm. 
But I I think the Buddhists, especially I think Tibetan Buddhists and all Buddhists of all hues, uh, have a deep resistance to the word self, the Atma, because the whole construction of Buddhist inquiry was on a non-self, anatman basis. I, I think one should be perfectly com- comfortable giving them that terminological concession. If you would like to call it the non-self, excellent. I think that, that, that's good, uh, uh, good enough. Hmm. Well, w- one distinction here is that it can be made by reference to the term emptiness or, or shunyata, yes, which is distinct. So if we talk about the one self, capital S, and you know, moving from this illusory sense of separateness into a recognition of that underlying reality, there can be this expectation that what we're talking about is is a unity experience or a merging experience. Like the little me merges with the big me, capital S, self. And I think that's what the Buddhists want to resist because there's, there's a difference between unity and simply there being no duality. The unity suggests a kind of reification and even a kind of grasping or potential clinging to something. Uh, whereas the the no thingness of what remains is simply what remains when there's no center, you know, when there's no division between subject and object, then everything is in, in its own place, and then all these seeming paradoxes can persist, and they don't have to be reconciled with an assertion of oneness. So there's there's it's not it can't be one thing, because everything still appears in all its multiplicity. And it's not nothing because there is this brilliant display of you know, the contents of consciousness, but it's not many things either because everything is clearly just a modification of this mysterious condition in which everything appears. So that's, there are many analogies that we tend to use here, but perception from the point of view of you know, non-dual awareness, the, the world that we perceive does have something like the character of a dream or something like the character of appearances in a mirror in that everything is equalized as being recognized as a, as a mere modification of the, the cognizance function of, of consciousness. And yet to assert that, you know, capital C consciousness is what we are and what remains is to somehow be grasping at, at metaphysics, whereas there really is a, you know, from the Buddhist point of view, there is nothing to assert, right? There is simply a recognition of no center. And the rest is thought, right? The rest is to be taken in by thought and, and discursiveness. And so that's, yeah, that, I mean, that's how I see this, this emphasis on negation and this, this allergy to statements like there's just the, the self or Brahman or or aware, capital A awareness, but, but you know when I read when I read a book like I don't know the the Astravakra Gita say from my point of view it's it's a wonderful description of the experience, but there's just part of me that and in some ways I actually like that language that the more positive language more than what one tends to find in Buddhism, but you know I I, I do take as a kind of footnote to a text like that this final instruction of not to reify anything. Right. In fact, that's one good way of understanding the difference between Advaita Vedanta and Tibetan Buddhism. The language, the language in Advaita Vedanta can easily lead to the mistake of reification, Hmm. that there exist these entities, Atman, Brahman, you know, like things. Among many things in the world, there is this thing, or there's an ultimate thing. But that's not what Advaita Vedanta wants to say. And the language on the Tibetan Buddhist side, if you especially see the language of Chandrakirti and the, you know, like Tsongkhapa and others and more radical uh, of the Tibetan lamas later on, Hmm. the language can easily mislead us into thinking they were uh, uh, nihilists, that they are trying to say nothing exists. But that's the limitation of, of language. What Advaita Vedanta would want actually to say is that if you see, if you think of um, of a vast space, a limitless space, and lit up, you know, like vast blue sky, not just sky, but but also uh, lit up, 
So the vastness, that emptiness would be pure being and uh, that lighting up aspect of it, that awareness aspect of it would be pure consciousness. That's the understanding of limitless being sat and limitless consciousness chit. Mm. A good way of understanding this difference would be from the Hindu side, a rival school of the Advaitins is called the Vishishta Advaitin. And they say that there is one unlimited being, Brahman, and everything else is a part of Brahman. So all sentient beings are like tiny parts. They, in fact, use the analogy of a body and the cells. So the body is one reality. It's an organic unity. But clearly, the hands and the feet and the organs are all distinct parts of this organic unity. Exactly like that, these, these qualified monists, they claim that mm -hmm. Brahman or God is this one um, organic unity of this universe and conscious beings and non-conscious entities are like tiny parts which go into this unity. Advaita Vedanta actually clearly rejects this. Mm. Advaita Vedanta says, no, no, no. Brahman and this universe don't have the relation of part and whole. In fact, there is this underlying nature of things, the, the existence, consciousness, and the entirety of this universe, sentient beings, the worlds, and all of that, tiny particles, everything, it's more like a, a magical display, like a city, they use terms like a city of cl in the clouds, a Gandharvanagar, a city in the clouds, mm. or the, a favorite for them is a dream analogy, or the you know, classic, the rope mistaken for a snake. Yeah. So it's not that you know, in a semi-darkness somebody sees a rope and thinks it's a snake. It's not that the snake is a part of the rope, or not that uh, you know, there's a snake which merged in the rope and you became enlightened. No, there was no snake. It's the rope alone which looked like a snake. Yeah. Everything in a dream. It's like a virtual world, but all of that is not a part of the waking person. It's just the waking person's mind in a dream state appears as that uh, world, as that dream world. So exactly like that, because of Maya, the same existence, consciousness, bliss, you know, existence appears as existing things, and consciousness is experienced as conscious experiences, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and so on and so forth. And the bliss aspect of it appears as the pleasure and pain of this universe. But yeah, so it is the inner reality of this universe, you might say, or our own inner reality. If you like, there's one issue here, which I would like to go on to the sure. non-duality. How do you get from one consciousness to non-duality? Yeah, please build a bridge. Yeah, yeah that, that's very important. You know, the uh, the first step in Advaita Vedanta is to appreciate that how we are not essentially not the body, mind, uh, we are this witness consciousness. But then the question arises, I mean, there's a, a secondary question here of, is there one witness consciousness or many? Because our intuitive field would be that we are many people, so there are many witness consciousnesses. But then Advaita says that, no, there aren't. There is one witness consciousness, and there are arguments back and forth about this. The Sankhyans hold that Consciousness, pure consciousness also is many. There are multiple pure consciousnesses. And Advaita says, and the way Advaita deals with it is, it turns the question around and asks the Sankhyan, why would you distinguish pure consciousness from pure consciousness? I mean, you can clearly distinguish a body from a body. You can distinguish minds from each other. Mm -hmm. But you can't distinguish consciousness from bare consciousness, minus body, mind, or minus any particulars. So that's how Advaita Vedanta wants to say that there is one underlying consciousness. But the more interesting question is, what is the relationship between consciousness and that which consciousness experiences? And here, I'll give like five, very quickly, five answers to this, which you see broadly find in Indian thought. Uh, one is the materialist answer, very much so in, in tune with the modern materialist reductionist and all, you know. So the materialist answer would be, Consciousness is secondary. It's, it's matter. It's the objective universe, which is primary, and consciousness emerges from the objective universe. They actually said that thousands of years back, and mm. they said consciousness is a product of things which is going on in the body. The second answer would be that consciousness is primary, and the material universe emerges from consciousness. And contrary to what one might think, this is not Advaita. This is actually the theistic religions of the world, including Hinduism. And they say God created the universe. I mean, one common idea of God in all the theistic traditions is God is the creator of the universe. And presumably, the Advaitin says, God is supposed to be conscious, right? So in that case, you are saying consciousness created this universe. That's the second answer. 
And there are big problems with each answer. Mm -hmm. Then there is the third answer, the Sankhyan answer. And also I would say panpsychism of the kind David Chalmers says it could be possible mm -hmm. that neither created the other. They are all fundamental realities, the material universe, time, space, and all of that is fundamental reality. And so is consciousness. And consciousness mm -hmm. is ubiquitous and they somehow interact. So that was the third answer, the Sankhyan school and the Patanjali yoga school, they held this. So we are beings of pure consciousness, but we have, we are interacting with the material universe. We are interacting with bodies and minds. Then there is the fourth answer, which would be, say, the, um, the Madhyamaka answer, which says both of them, consciousness and you know, the appearances in consciousness, they are dependent on each other. They are, neither of them are ultimate realities. They are empty. Chandrakirti gives an example, which the Advaitin would never give. The example is of two bales of hay, you know, nice uh, tied, and two bales of hay leaning against each other. Mm. And if you pull out one, the other one goes. Right. So uh, when the Advaitin would say that consciousness is always there, even, even when the uh, objects of consciousness do not appear. So for example, in deep sleep, that's the uh, bone of contention. Mm -hmm. So Advaitins would say in deep sleep, or today we might ask what about coma or, or anesthesia. That seems to be an interruption in consciousness. And the uh, Madhyamaka, the Chandrakirti, they would, they would agree. They would say, you see, your precious consciousness is gone. When you don't have an object of consciousness, you're not, there's no, at least there's no experience of consciousness at all. And then there is the fifth answer, which is the Advaitic answer, which says that uh, the entire material universe is an appearance in consciousness and not distinct from consciousness. So the mind is the first appearance in consciousness and the sensory senses and the body and the external universe, all of them appear in consciousness and they are nothing but consciousness appearing to itself. In that sense, non-duality, that there is no countable second apart from that bare consciousness. Mm. And yet, even after this understanding, the world goes on exactly as it is. What is the nature of this one unlimited pure being? The Advaitin would say exactly what you're experiencing now. This is that one pure uh, being, unlimited awareness existence. Mm. So this is how the Advaitins establish this non-dual, non-duality of being or consciousness. They, are, they take them interchangeably, pure being and pure awareness. I think mm. this has the advantage, multiple advantages. One is, this is a pretty good way of, you know, phenomenologically describing in a deep way what is our experience right now. Mm. Second, it does not run counter to science. It allows for scientific thought and understanding and discovery. I mean, one, one good question is sometimes that, so if everything is in consciousness, then how do things exist apart from consciousness? So here Advaita Vedanta makes a clear distinction between consciousness and knowing. That's why the distinction between consciousness and mind is important. Would you like me to go into this a, a little bit? Uh, sure. I, I think I should just say where, uh, where my own intuitions run here, because I, I think uh, it sounded like you, you landed on this distinction in the end. You know, I, I think that final variant, the, the Advaitic one, the, the fifth one, as a matter of phenomenology, makes perfect sense. I think you can be agnostic with respect to the metaphysics. You cannot make any claims about how consciousness relates to the physical universe or the, you know, the, even the physical brain. You can be uncertain as to at what point it arises in nature or whether it does arise or you know, how, you know, how it relates to the physics of things. But you can recognize that as a matter of experience, there is only consciousness and its modifications, right? And, e and even your experience of being a, you know, whatever you're calling the physical world and your physical body in that physical world, all of that is appearing to you as a modification of consciousness. And that is, that's the only option, whatever the metaphysics. And uh, so I, I, for me, just as, as an intellectual matter, I tend to just bracket all questions of a third person view of consciousness for a kind of a separate discussion, and I, I, I think the, you know, we're, we're genuine as, as a matter of science, we're, we're genuinely uncertain about all of that. I, you know, you mentioned David Chalmers. I think 
the hard problem of, of consciousness is, is truly hard and, and still with us. But as a matter of experience, everything we're saying about the illusoriness of the self and the nature of emptiness and, and its recognizability and its availability even in ordinary states of consciousness, all, all of that, I think, is empirically, phenomenologically true. Uh, and we can bracket the metaphysics and, and, the, and the third person aspects to this. I, I would agree with you. We have this uh, very senior member of the Vedanta Society here, Bill Conrad. He is a veteran of the Second World War. He used to fly bombers over the mm. Pacific. Oh. He's 98 years old now, oh. and he's a physicist. And he says more or less exactly what you said. He says, without buying into the metaphysics of Advaita Vedanta, I said, in that case, you've been a member of this Vedanta Society before I was born, you know, since before I was born. So why do you keep coming if you don't uh, uh, accept the metaphysics of it? And he says, because it works. It works mm -hmm. experientially. If I meditate, it has uh, this effect on, on my inner ex life, you know. And so to that extent, he accepts it. But he, we had an interesting discussion about this, you know, the nature of consciousness and objects. He tends to conflate the Advaita view with a kind of Berkeleyan subjective idealism. Mm -hmm. So his, yeah, his, his uh, doubt was, well, Swami, we are sitting here. Suppose we were to both leave this room and I would set up a camera recording this room and then we would come back and when we would see the pictures in the camera, you would see for yourself that there was no conscious being in this room and yet every object in this room existed as it were. What do you say to that? Now, what Advaita would say to that is this, that, um, you know, I said to him, Bill, in your consciousness, you designed this experiment. And in your consciousness, in consciousness itself, you set up the camera and invited me to leave the room. And we left the room in consciousness. And in our conscious experience, we came back into the room. And in our conscious experience, we saw the pictures in the camera showing us an empty room. At which point have we stepped outside consciousness? And is it at all possible to step outside consciousness? You can't. <laughs> uh, so that's what it means. I mean, here there's a very important distinction between consciousness and mind. So what Advaita would say is that it's quite possible that everything is in consciousness, but then it neatly divides into something which is known and a vast unknown. So to know things, even if everything is within consciousness, to know something, you need to deploy instruments of knowledge like senses and science and whatever, whatever way we all know things. Otherwise, although everything is in consciousness, it would appear as a blank unknown. So that's where I think that's what makes science or Advaita compatible with the scientific search and it would not come into contradiction at any point. Science is using the same consciousness, powered by the same consciousness. We use uh, scientific, our, our senses and machinery and scientific methodologies to, you know, gain access to the unknown and make it known, all within the same consciousness. Yeah, I, I, I think there would be a contradiction for, for people who are taking the, the Advaitic metaphysics as their focus. There's a potential contradiction to take one possible scientific solution to the, the, the hard problem, uh, or at least a solution to the, the question of what is the status of consciousness, whether this can be intuitively satisfying or not, it just may be the case that consciousness only arises in you know, certain complex systems that process information in certain ways, and, and, and only parts of the human brain qualify as such systems. So it just may be true to say that there, there is a neural correlate of consciousness. Uh, we don't fully understand it yet, but it's not the whole brain. It's just parts of the brain in certain states that produce everything we're talking about, the physical substrate for everything we're talking about subjectively. And this has certain implications. It, it, one, it might have the implication that you could do this in other systems because it really is just a, a matter of the functional integration and, and information processing of these systems. It's not a matter of it being in a computer made of meat. So we could build conscious computers, uh, and we, we may in fact do that. And it also suggests that when people die, consciousness really is extinguished, right? So there is a, a hierarchy where the, you know, the, the physical materialist reality is, governs the subjective 
conscious reality in ways that are counterintuitive, but just may in fact be real. And so when you're dead, you're really dead. And any expectation of uh, future lives makes no sense on that account. Um, although I, w- I would say as a, there's a section in, in Waking Up where I discuss the, the views of uh, this philosopher, Tom Clark, which uh, give a, a kind of materialist picture of rebirth, essentially, that is pretty interesting. Uh, I would leave that aside for a moment. But in any case, there's a possible contradiction there, but I don't see any contradiction if you emphasize the phenomenological empirical side, which is this is what first-person experience is like if you pay sufficient attention to it. And in fact, there it brings experience into closer conformity with what we have every reason to believe scientifically about the nature of, of mind and its relationship to the brain. I mean, for instance, there's no way to make sense of the ego in neurophysiological terms. I mean, it's just, it, there's no place in the brain where you, where you can detect the existence of an ego, nor would it be plausible for there to be an unchanging self in the middle of, of the brain in any way, given what the brain is doing and given how its, its states change. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's where I tend to leave it. It's not that the, those other questions are, are uninteresting. I just think they're currently unresolvable. And yeah, and, and yet the, the, the important part of, you know, suffering and the end of suffering uh, and cutting through the illusions that keep us on the, the uh, suffering side of that continuum, uh, that, that can be solved and it can be solved very directly. Yes. I, I personally think that the hard problem of consciousness is very significant. But uh, having said that, my personal attitude to this whole question of uh, science and Advaita or Buddhism is, you know, to be fairly relaxed about it in the sense of know the systems very well, but don't hold on to the systems too tightly and keep Mm -hmm. an uh, open eye for developments and be comfortable with uh, ready to change. Sometimes from from our side, the Vedantic side, or from spiritual seekers, we have this question that these systems are complete in themselves. They are ancient systems, Advaita or Tibetan Buddhism, and they have arguably taken thousands of people over the centuries to moksha or nirvana or enlightenment. So why do we need to have a discussion with, with, about, with, about science at all in these uh, realms? Uh, and I say that it's good to have a discussion about science because, first of all, my sense of the people who uh, who were pioneers in these systems, all the way down back to the Buddha or you know Adi Shankara and other the Vedic rishis, the kind of minds I see in their writings and their teachings, they would be interested. They would be very interested in mm-hmm. developments in science. And the second is, like it or not, we live in a world of science, and we have been brought up to think from a school days in a sort of generally scientific framework. I don't think one can reasonably or one even ought to leave out science and scientific thinking, even in one's spiritual pursuit. Yeah. You can engage the phenomenological side very much in the spirit of science. I mean, really what we're suggesting is a a methodology by which one can confirm various hypotheses. And it's never a matter of taking any of these claims on faith. It's just a matter of being, I mean... If there's a monicum of faith here, it's just the faith that you individually can look into it for yourself, that you're not cursed in some kind of unique you know, outer darkness where, you, where these facts, if they exist to be seen, are unavailable to you, right? It's like, you know, can you notice, and, you know, like the, the claim, to take a very simple claim, thoughts are impermanent. You know, thoughts arise and then they pass away, right? And 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 emotions are impermanent. You know, an emotion like anger appears, but then it eventually fades away. This is an empirical claim about the nature of one of subjectivity, and it's a universal claim. It's a claim I'm making not just about myself, but about any listener. But a listener looking into this for the first time can say, "Well, is is that true? I'm, I don't need to take that on faith. Let me see." And those are facts that about a person's mind that are there to be seen, and you know that really the only thing to take on faith is that 
it's not a complete waste of time to look. If you want to know more about what it's like to be you, you know, it makes sense to pay more attention. That really is the the only necessary starting point for this kind of inquiry. Right. In Advaita Vedanta, one of the prerequisites for being a student is uh, Shraddha. So Shraddha is a Sanskrit mm. word which can be translated as faith. And immediately people say, oh, here too you need faith, but, but didn't you say that uh, it's the path of devotional religion, which is faith-based, and here you don't need faith? And the way I explain it is exactly what you said, that uh, the only kind of faith you require here is the faith that there is something worthwhile here, something mm. worthwhile inquiring, something enormously useful to us if we would just stop and look. And at no point are you asked to take anything on, on you know, just as belief, as unverifiable or belief. In fact, Advaita Vedanta insists that at every step we must stop and see whether I understand it correctly and also check that whether it seems real to me, whether it is a lived fact. And that's the only way to go forward. Because in Advaita Vedanta, very soon, if you just read a text, very soon we'll be in the realm of what seems to be pure speculation or metaphysics. But the remarkable thing about Advaita Vedanta is that it is actually, it's actually a phenomenological inquiry. At every mm. point, it's dealing with something directly available to us all the time. So uh, how do you think about freedom at this point? How do you think about what remains when you bring this path to something like you know, full maturity. You know, there are many people who understand exactly what we're talking about and, and experience it, and they're, so they're practicing, but they have relinquished any image of, of final enlightenment as somehow being either unattainable or unrealistic or just dangerous to entertain because there have been, there's so many examples of obviously awakened teachers who, who, have contributed to the, the spiritual lives of many people, but have also behaved terribly in their roles as gurus and created immense harm, right? So they're not, they're not pure frauds, many of these teachers, but based on perhaps a delusion of their own perfection or the, the, the systems of thought in which they were put at the top of a hierarchy and treated like you know, living Buddhas, they got drunk on their power and behaved in ways that are indefensible. So, you know, many smart people who, are, who have uh, followed us this far in the conversation nevertheless have decided that there's kind of a perpetual incompleteness to the path. You know, the, there's really only just, it's a path of endless new beginnings, but there's no final terminus, right? There's no place at which you can f say that you've fully stabilized this intuition into non-duality, say, right? This is going to be a, you know, they're, they're not expecting anything other than a perpetual vacillation between the wisdom of emptiness and being taken in again, taken in once again by the illusion of duality, right? Like the, they, they keep falling back asleep and dreaming again and then waking up. And um, that describes my experience, certainly, but I haven't relinquished an image, at least, of the possibility of actually never being taken in by the illusion again. I mean, just the, the, the reality of, of emptiness becomes so obvious that it becomes impossible to overlook. And there's an image I, I like, especially from the Tibetan tradition of the different stages of the liberation of thought. And the, I believe the first stage is like a you know, a writing on water, right? You know, you, you no sooner do you trace a letter on on the surface of water that it mm -hmm. begins to vanish, and that's it. so. At, at a certain stage of practice, thoughts arise in that way, uh, and then the second stage is uh, a snake, you know, untying itself from a knot. You know, thoughts liberate themselves, uh, you know, of their own accord, uh, and then finally, and this is the image I actually really like, in the final stage. Thoughts are like thieves entering an empty house. There's nothing for them to steal, right? There's just there's no problem with thieves in an empty house. And in the end, you know, the arising of thoughts will, will never for a moment imply a dualistic separate self that is encumbered by thoughts. And there's nothing to be liberated. There's nothing to be meditated upon. There's no possibility of distraction. There's just reality again, from the phenomenological side. And yet, 
I would say most of the teachers I've spoken with have tended to kind of give up a picture of, of a final uh, accomplishment here, a final state. You know, the, the, uh, you know everyone you know, loves the concept of awakening now, but not too many people are thinking about full enlightenment. I'm wondering where you, you come down on that question. Yes. I noticed you used the word stabilized. And it's interesting that Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, he asks Krishna, after Krishna tells him about the real nature of the Atman, uh, he asks the question, so what is it like to be a person of stabilized wisdom? He uses the mm. Sanskrit word sthita pragya. Pragya means consciousness uh, or wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, enlightenment. And sthita means stabilized, stabilized enlightenment. Mm. So this problem was uh, recognized long ago. I think it in the Buddhist tradition, very, very well recognized. And also in the Advaita Vedanta tradition, there are books on it. And the conclusion, I think, definitely from the Advaita side and also from the Buddhist side, as far as I know, is that it is possible to be a being of stabilized wisdom, to be fully enlightened and manifesting that enlightenment in this life. Uh, the goal in Advaita Vedanta is called Jivan Mukti. Mm. Jivan means living. Mukti means liberation, living liberation. So you're still, for all practical purposes, embodied in this body. You have the same old mind, but you realize what you truly are and everybody else and everything else truly is. And then you continue to live the life as it was. But then you bring a, an extraordinary quality of enlightenment to that life. Now, this question of a final attainment, Advaita's answer would be, the final attainment is already there. Mm -hmm. In Sanskrit, they call it praptasya prapti, attaining what you have attained. And nivrittasya nivritti, that means what is given up, solved, dismissed, is something that was never there, a problem that never existed. And that sounds, <laughs> uh, but, but that makes very uh, good sense from the perspective of, you know, pure consciousness. So you are this pure consciousness right now. I remember this monk in the Himalayas who would often say, in Hindi, he would say this, what he meant, what he said was, whether you know it or you do not know it, whether you believe it or not, whether you accept it or not, you are Rama. That means you are God. <laughs> so it is an attainment of something already attained and choicelessly attained. You can't not attain it. Mm. So it's always there. Yet the problem is not, uh, not an invalid problem. It's what one might call an advanced problem. It's not a problem of the beginner. It's the problem of the person who begins to see for the first time that uh, meditation and inquiry begins to reveal one catches glimpses of what one, one truly is or what is the nature of things. Then this question arises that I see what you are saying. I get it also. But the thing is, I can't live it. And there seem to be a number of gurus and teachers who also can't seem to live it consistently also. So what's going wrong here? So there is a, one entire book about this called Jivan Mukti Viveka by the same Vidyaranya Swami whose book I quoted earlier, and Rig Drishya Viveka. The Jivan Mukti Viveka is an, uh, is an analysis or an inquiry into the nature of uh, living liberation. Mm. His basic thesis is that uh, this full-blown liberation consists of three components. One is what we call enlightenment. In Sanskrit, tattva jnana, knowledge of reality or realization of the reality. This is what we call, what, what persons might say that, I've seen it or I, I get it, it's clear to me. So that's only one component of the uh, requirement. So you are enlightened if you, if you see that. But there are two more components. The next component is called vasanakshaya, purification of mind. Literally, it means destructions of uh, past impression or, or purification of past impressions. And the third component is manonasha. It's uh, literally, it means destruction of the mind, which is ominous, but it, all it means is the ability to plunge the mind into deep meditation. Uh, I mean, a very thorough, advanced training in meditation, in samadhi, basically. Mm. So, according to this text, full liberation, full-blown liberation, living it in this life, would uh, have these three components. One is, of course, you must know the truth, that I am Atman, Brahman, or I am pure consciousness. That's the real nature of myself and everything else also. So this is, becomes a vivid, clear realization beyond doubt, an absolute clarity about this. Then the second one would be 
impurities, the impure mind must be converted into a pure mind. This impure mind is the result of conditioning in this life and if you believe in past lives, in multiple lifetimes. And how do you do this? This requires the hard work, the drudgery of a determined ethical life. Mm. Trying to manifest this enlightenment realization through a moral life, a strictly moral life. And the third one is training in meditation so that you don't get swept up. The mind doesn't get swept away again and again. You can focus on the reality and stay there, stay with it in samadhi. When one has all three developed, that's full-blown enlightenment. And such a person would not slip morally, would not, be, would not commit ethical blunders. Mm. Now, one point he makes is, here this idea of a progressive path and direct realization. He says, those who have been on a progressive path, and he calls it Kritopasti, who have performed the entire course of spiritual practices. For them, when enlightenment comes, it's full-blown enlightenment, it's full-blown liberation. Because the other, the basic groundwork has already been done. Mm. But for others, some might stumble on this, some might uh, inquire deeply into it and get a flash of, a glimpse of this reality. But the other components have not been developed yet. So for them, what is recommended is, don't become a guru, don't go on a lecture tour or start writing books, mm -hmm. intensify uh, spiritual practices. What spiritual practices? The same old stuff which you were doing earlier, strictly moral life, self-restraint, and uh, deepen your meditation. No longer in search of a truth, you already found it, mm. but to stay there, to stay with it, and to see, ultimately, it's not, you're not really, you don't even have to stay there. You are choicelessly there anyway, and it's mm. all right. I love those three examples you gave. The writing, the thoughts are first like writing water on, uh, like writing words on flowing water, and then a snake uncoiling itself, and then thieves in an empty house. I'll, with your permission, I'll borrow them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forget the origin of that. It, it appears in the Dzogchen teachings, but it, I don't know if it's Padmasambhava or uh, Longchenpa, or I'll, I'll try to track it down for you. Swamiji, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I, I love where we arrived. I, and um, remind me, what, what was the name of the book uh, that you... Uh, just recommended on uh, embodying the enlightened life, the uh, it's, um, Jivan Mukta Viveka or something? Jivan Mukti Viveka, published by Advaita Ashrama, translated by Swami Moksha Dhananda. Mm. I can send it to yeah, no, demon. No, I'll, I will uh, happily purchase it. Wonderful to get your voice here, Swamiji. Uh, I hope it's the first of many conversations. Absolutely, Sam. And you have a standing invitation to visit us here at the Vedanta nice. Society, the congregation here, they are familiar with you, they're very familiar because I on and off keep quoting you. So <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, well, we'll do that. I'd love to do that.